Part five, which I call bells and whistles. I originally had a little more content in here, but realized that probably would not have quite enough time to cover everything I could think of. But there are a few a uh, few topics here that I think are, are worthy of going over. Um, one is filtering out zero amount columns. Um, so I'm going to go back to my my workbook that I saved, and what I'm referring to is like rules like this. You know, do you really want to see that on your financial statement if it has nothing in there? And I can't really build that condition into the query itself because, you know, the TSG amount functions are deriving values from different period buckets and rolling backward or forward and whatnot. So I can't really build that into the query itself. Um, so an approach that we can use, and you'll see this in a lot of the pre-built reports that are on the launch pad, is to sort of add some logic in the worksheet that allows us to apply a filter to filter out rows that, that are zeros. Um, so I can start off by saying, add a simple um, formula that says, if this is zero and this is zero, okay, then that indicates that that should not be hidden when kind of after. Uh, whereas the ones that are true are rows that should be hidden. So that's kind of the first step. And then, of course, column E would be a column that I would intend on hiding. It doesn't really need to be part of the report design. Okay. Um, the process then to hide those rows is I can highlight the whole column. I can go up here to data. Um, I can go to filter. And then I can say, I only want to see uh, the ones that are false or blank. The true ones, I don't want to see those rows. And so that filters those out. Now, of course, that works great just now. But when I refresh the data, what happens? Uh, the answer is when I refresh the data, the filter goes away. And now I'd have to reapply that. So uh, there's, there's an easy process to follow for that. Which, by the way, this is being recorded, so you'll be provided this as a resource later to refer back to uh, when you need to do this. Um, first thing is, um, when you refresh data using Office Connector toolbar, like clicking on the lightning bolt right there, um, there are a couple of macros that you can create. The Office Connector will run automatically for you, as long as you name them what you need to name them. I'll show you how you figure that out. Uh, so if we go to uh, event, one, event one website, and I'll show you how I get there. Um, and again, we can provide a link to this in a follow-up. I go to support, get help, uh, documentation. It's also, I guess I could have clicked on the help menu on the toolbar. We've gotten me to the same spot. I'll just enter query right. And I just happen to know the topic that I'm after has to do with um, events. So I look for event macros. This is a good thing to be aware of. So what this is telling me is if I create a macro in Excel and I name the macro that before TS refresh data, then Office Character will respect that. And when I click the lightning bolt, before it refreshes any data, it'll run my macro. Likewise, if I name the macro after TS refresh data, when it gets done refreshing data, it runs my macro, as long as I've named it with that name. So we can kind of use those uh, two event macros to sort of automate the removal and reapplication of that filter so that our zero not rows get filtered out for us. So I'll, I'll step through that right now. Um, I'm going to go back to my original state here where I said um, that's not selected. So what I'm going to do is go to the Developer tab. Now, if you don't have a Developer tab, uh, make sure to activate that. You just find it under File, Options, uh, Customize Ribbon, and then just make sure that's checked. 
by default, it's not checked out of the box. So I think Microsoft doesn't trust everyone to have that tab or something. Um, make sure your develop tab is, is, is active. Um, and then what I'm going to do is click on the record macro. Again, the name is important, so it's going to be before TF refresh data. Okay. So I uh, select that, and then I'm going to go to my data tab and unapply my filter. And now I'm done. So that's that's what's going to happen every time now when I when I refresh data is it's always going to unapply the filter. And now I'm going to do something similar where I'm going to um, again go back and record another macro. Spell it right. So after TS refresh data, and I'll follow that same set of steps I did earlier. I'm going to select column E. I'm going to go to my data tab, filter it. Apply a filter that removes the ones that are zero and zero. And that's all I have to do there then. And of course, I'll probably go ahead and hide the column as part of that macro. Something to make note of there. And then um, go back to the developer tab, stop reporting. And so now I've kind of automated that. So now when I click the refresh button, um, it's going to do those two steps. And I, um, remove the filter, refresh the data, and then reapply the filter to filter out the zero amount. And that's basically the technique you're going to see in a lot of the pre-built templates as far as how we're eliminating the the, the zero dollar account. Uh, not required to do that. That's just you know preference if you don't want to see those accounts. Um, as always, you know the the macro that Excel creates behind the scenes. You can access that. Just go into macros and click edit. And we're seeing um, uh, VBA code here. The VBA code that Excel writes for you when you're recording a macro is um, not great. It, it gets the job done. It actually reports what you did. Um, but someone with more robust VBA skills would probably look at this and go, oh, well, there's actually a better way to do this. That could probably even get it done to almost one line. Um, and again, you'll see examples of that in the templates that are on launch pad. We've kind of made that better so that you don't maybe see uh, screen flickering and stuff like that going on. It's not really necessary. Okay, so VBA skills are always good to have when you're when you're doing uh, any kind of complex Excel stuff. Um, any questions on that part of it? I know we kind of covered that fairly quickly, but. Any questions um, about that? I just I just wanted to mention that if you add if you add that filtering macro, you might want to remember that you can't add columns once you've done that. Um unless you go into the code and change which columns it's going to filter on. That's a very good point. Yeah, because if we look at the way that macro works and I know this is VBA code, but you see, like, for example, you know, there's some references to column names and stuff. So you're right. If if um, if you insert columns later, then column E is no longer your filter column, then you'll need to change that. And actually, I, I didn't quite that didn't quite do that topic justice in, in the way that I could have also said, let's select column E, name the entire column, filter column. Okay, and then when I recorded my macro, instead of selecting column E like that, actually it does it for me. But I could all I could have also said pick filter column, and what that would cost to have have happened is in the macro instead of the macro recording column E, the macro would record filter column, and that would make it a little bit more impervious to adding columns because even if column E gets moved over three columns, it's still a named filter column. The name follows it. So that's a good point, though, uh, that made me think of uh, the fact that we can name the column as a way to avoid uh, that issue. Any other questions? All right. Um, I'm also going to cover 
And, and I'm going to cover this next topic fairly briefly just because there's a video on it. And again, this can be part of our, our follow-up. Um, but there's a function in an Office Connector called OC Retain. And I think for the purposes of this, I'm going to, no, I'm going to remove my filter for a moment. Um, and actually, I'm going to take this up further. For, for right now, I'm just going to remove my macros too, to make this easier to demonstrate. Um, I don't really need that anymore. Okay, let's say that I wanted to have a comments column. And this could also be a forecast column or any other kind of data entry column for, for manual input. Um, and let's, let's, say, let's create a scenario where let's say um, right now, you know, let's say originally these accounts didn't exist. Okay, so we're kind of going back in time and saying those accounts didn't exist at the present. And uh, I want to have a place here to put, um, this is new, uh, comment, okay? That's a comment for my sale parts account. Well, what's going to happen when I refresh? Let's refresh. And is that not a... Okay. But I deleted the. Uh, did I not do that right? <laughs> Try that again. Let's count 4110. And I refresh my data. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so that, that was right. I, I put a comment on account 4110, but now. 4110 is on row 12. My comment is still back up on row 10. So my comment is now on the wrong account. That's what I was trying to demonstrate. That's what we, that's what we want to avoid. You're going to encounter that with data entry columns unless you follow the process I'm about to describe. And so that that is not the cool Office Connector thing that he was going to show you. No, it's not. What I'm trying to right show there. is that's, that's, that's what happens to everybody else. <laughs> So there's a function, uh, again, this is on the function selector. If we go down here and select OC retain, uh, again, there's a video and you can, you can get to the video right here and it'll actually show you like a five minute explanation of exactly how to do this. And it's a great video. Um, well, I'll insert this and I'll say- may I, may I say that the help is getting better and better and better? <laughs> Outstanding. So the value that I want to make sure sticks with the correct account is the target value. The fill down formula is basically uh, what I want to have show up, um, you know, for any new rows. And I can just leave that blank too, and that's fine. Uh, the key identifies the row. So the key in this case is the account number that uniquely identifies a given row. So I insert that. Now, the OC routine function doesn't return anything that we really care about. It's just more of an instruction. So I'm just going to end up hiding column F. I will copy that down here. I'm going to go ahead and set this up like this. So I have some placeholders already in here, like such. And I'll also apply that to my other section. Okay. Well, I end up hiding column F. I'm going, to re I'm going to simulate that issue again where I'm going to remove these. I'm just going to refresh this first. I'll, I'll simulate that same scenario where I'll, I'll remove those three accounts as if they didn't previously exist. And now today they do. So this is a test. Okay, will, will my comment stay on the same, stay, stay on the correct row? Like refresh. I'm guessing yes. Okay. And my comment stayed on the correct row. Even though it got moved down to is the new account, it stayed on the, on the correct row. So that's what OC Retain is designed to do for you, is it, is it keeps the data lined up with the row that it should be on, even between refreshes. Um, so, you know, for financial statements, I just want to add something, Mike, that, that a lot of people who 
are going from like financial statements, just printed out of financial statements or whatever else. When they say they want to produce their financials in Excel, the number one reason is for comments. And then there are additional reasons for like adding information from other sources or whatever, but comments, the number one reason. And the biggest issue that we had originally was that the comments didn't stay on the correct row. So they had to get rid of them, refresh, and then put them all back in again. Right. So again, that's what that's designed to accomplish. Um, and there's a video that kind of takes you to that, say, that exact same process. And all we would do is make that column hidden. Uh, I always recommend that any column you intend to make hidden, just color code it like that. Because like when I work on a report, uh, I'll have the whole thing unhidden. I mean, there might be like four or five hidden columns for doing different calculations or O2 chains or, or what have you. Uh, while I'm working on it, it's great to have everything unhidden. When you're done working on it, you need to remember which columns you need to go back and rehide. So having them color coded like that is just a good, good practice. Um, okay, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about before we uh, start to wrap up here and entertain any last questions is uh, just the additional helper functions. Um, so I want to go back to um, my function selector. And you know, by far the TSGL amount function, of course, that's the heart of Office of financial financials. Everything really happens there. The other functions below it are kind of supporting functions. We already looked at the TSGL, TL, sorry, ah, TSGL base range function, the helper function, formats uh, a range for you. These other functions are similar. So uh, TSGL period date. So the idea is that I can I can pass in the prefix, uh, the fiscal year, the period, and it gives me, and I'll specify what type of date I want, and it gives me back a date. So um, handy if, you know, well, if, if you're on a calendar year basis, it probably isn't quite as meaningful because you would know that period five is May. But if you're not on a calendar year basis and you want to get the actual ending date for period five, um, that's what that would return. Um, and you can pass in different values uh, for that. They're described down here. So you can have it return the period begin and end, year begin, um, current year begin, current year end. So all those are dates that we can get out with that function. Useful usually for including in the report header. Um, do keep in mind, though, that uh, if you're if you pass in um, a set of prefixes, so the prefixes are going to be the same. That could be like a consolidation, of, you know, some set of prefixes. If the prefixes are in different period endings, so you know, one's ending, one current period ends in March, and the other one's current period ends in April, um, and you're trying to say, here's the current period ending date for this report. Well, you know, which one do you use? I mean, it's still going to give you the right amount, but uh, as far as which date to show, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to show the, um, um, the, uh, what I was going to say, the, the period ending date, period ending date of the first prefix that you encounter is in that group. Um, period number and period year are kind of similar. Uh, you can pass a date in. So I can say, you know, if, if the date is May 13th, 2013, uh, what period number does that represent? Same thing with the year. So again, this function that you could use within the header of your report possibly to provide more information. Those are all considered helper functions. And I'm not going to go through that in a lot of detail. The documentation's there, and they use a lot of the same arguments as the uh, ESGL amount function. And then the same thing with the TSGL prefix map. Uh, and actually, I will probably just cover this a, a little bit um, because this is kind of a cool function. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this prefix argument can be uh, a mask that includes wildcards. And so the prefix geo mask function just allows me to sort of uh, assemble that easier. So I could say, you know, if I have prefix A, prefix B, if I had three prefixes, rather, 
then I could say, you know, 10 here, 100 here, and anything there. And if I use my TSGL prefix mask, and I just go prefix A, prefix B, prefix C, and what it gives back is the properly formatted prefix mask to represent those three components put together with the appropriate separators and all that stuff. Um, in this case, it's only going to give me back 10 because it knows that I don't have three prefixes in the sample company that I'm working with. So it goes, huh, well, yeah, sure. You specify prefixes D and T, but we don't use those here. So just strip them off. Um, but that's what that function is designed to do. It just formats the prefix math for you and assembles all the pieces of the prefix um, if you're using more than one.